Uh, we're here to introduce Jason Sundrum from Facebook. He's going to give a talk on full stack approach to data visualization, terabytes and beyond. And Jason's a quantitative engineer at Facebook where he creates visualizations, applications to yield insights from petabytes of data. Before that, he was a uh, senior data scientist at PayPal where he analyzed and visualiz visualized geodata. Uh, he's an avid violinist and a chamber musician and a co-finder of the Hayden Enthusiast, a Bay Area collective that's performing the complete string quintet, quintet of Joseph Hayden. So let's welcome Jason and we have lots of good things to look forward to. Thanks. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Jason. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about some things I learned uh, while developing data visualizations at Facebook. I actually want to start by telling you a story. So like every good story, this one begins with um, something you're probably all familiar with. Recruiter spam. <laughs> so in the spring of 2012, I was living in Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, a few miles from Boston. I got an email from a recruiter at Facebook. And I actually replied to the email because I was intrigued by the possibilities for visualization that Facebook's um, rich and textured data offers. Um, and the fact that the weather is like maybe a little bit nicer in the Bay Area, um, I'm not going to lie, that probably played some part in my decision. Um, so like after some soul searching, I drove across the country and I was like, yeah, San Francisco, I'm here. And of course, you have to take this picture in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, so I did. Got to follow the rules. Um, so like, here I am. I'm in San Francisco. And I found my way, myself like, on the way to Facebook on one of these shuttle buses that everyone talks about now, uh, before everyone was talking about them. So that was cool um, for a while. Um, and I was headed uh, to MPK, as we call the campus here. Um, and I was actually like filled with a fair amount of uncertainty and doubt about like what is it that I'm doing at Facebook? Why am I here? Um, so why the doubt? Well, this is PyData, right? We're here to talk about Python and data. And um, I came to, to Facebook, and I was taught, taught about PHP and Hive. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> PHP. <laughs> and like Hive. I don't really know SQL that well, which I guess I shouldn't admit. Um, but uh, here, you heard it here. I, I wasn't great at SQL. I'm still not great at SQL. Um, so Facebook's core technologies were written in PHP, which I really didn't know very well. And all of my familiar tools, the things that I knew really well, um, Python, like all of the you know data manipulation uh, tools that probably a lot of you are familiar with, um, I also kind of wasn't sure how to use them. So I was like, what am I doing here? All the things I'm good at can't do. Um, so, fortunately, there's a happy ending, right? I'm not just going to like walk off the stage and go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I'm going to tell you about how I answered some of those questions and um, came up with the following revelations. So, first, all big data has to become small data in order to be visualized. Even a Retina display only has about five million pixels. So, if your data is bigger than five million points you got to start thinking about how to make it smaller. Second, what I'm calling the fresh data revolution, you've heard it here first, uh, it's really about why real-time systems are really great for big data. And finally, if life hands you more data, consider using more pixels. So I want this talk to leave you feeling inspired and empowered to use these revelations in your own work. Um, and I'll talk about the stack along the way. So they're going to be these little nuggets of, uh, of charts that are going to be deep, packed with meaning. What's up? Um, so I just want to do a quick survey to kind of get a sense of um, like what, our, what we have in common here. Um, so we're all Python programmers. I think that's everyone's hands. Good. Might be in the wrong room. Um, so do, how many people do front end work like uh, in JavaScript or anything like that? OK, 10% like maybe. Um, back end systems, OK, a lot of that. Database stuff, databases, good. Um, no databases, CSV files? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, who did I miss? Like, who, didn't, who hasn't raised their hand yet? 
Okay, people without hands. Um, so let me talk about my team a little bit. Um, we have diverse skills, right? <laughs> we build data-driven applications for insights. So we have, we're small, we're, but we're mighty. We have an economist, a machine learning PhD, a data engineer, and a visualization person, which is me. Um, and we have somebody to help us figure out what are the good things to do and what we really should not do. Um, I'll let you guess which one of those people goes with that face. Um, we also um, borrow time from designers when we can get it, um, because we are not designers, although we would very much like to be good at design. Um, so we're very much on the exploration side of the uh, kind of explanation explora exploration continuum that data visualization sort of falls into. So on the explanation side, you might sort of uh, have like a data science blog post where you like drill really deep into some particular issue and you, you think about it and you kind of tease out all of the possible, possible su subtleties and then you go, hey, this is what I see, this is what I understand. Um, exploration sort of is a lot more open-ended, so it's really about building tools um, to help other people say, I have a question, how can I answer this? And we use Python wherever possible. So it's not, it's, it might be religious, but it's, I, I'll say it's not religious. Uh, we, like to, we like to use Python wherever possible for our work. Um, so people talk a lot about big data, um, and they write books about it, too. And I guess there's some guy who just has a, has a headshot. He's big data, I guess. <laughs> uh, I don't know that guy, but I want to meet him. Um, so people talk about small data, too, and then uh, I read this post in The Atlantic about thick data, and they mean all kinds of different things, and, you know, just, like, adjective, like, noun, like, just add data on the end, and you've got something, apparently. Um, but as one of my friends on Twitter, and as Birch said earlier, big data is really kind of the same thing as small RAM, and I think there's some truth to that. Um, so, like, super, put more RAM in your machines, um, but at some point, like, try shipping a gig, of, a gig of data to your browser, and you've got problems. Um, try displaying, as I said earlier, more than 5 million points on a screen, and again, more problems. Um, but what I was the most excited about when I joined Facebook was figuring out what it means. What does it mean to try and visualize big data? So there are all these companies who are pr providing, like, solutions for big data problems. Um, and at Facebook, there are lots of different uh, systems for charting and exploring data. And when I first started, there were like a lot of questions that I had because that's what you come to Facebook with when they're like so much data, very curious. Uh, so just you know, think about any question you might have, and there's data to, to think about how to answer that question. And so I was like, how many photos are uploaded per minute, and how does that? vary over the course of the day, and how does it vary by country, and by mobile device, and just any other dimension that you can imagine. You're like, let's, let's slice and then maybe do some dicing, because that's what we do. Um, so there's like 350 million photos uploaded per day um, to Facebook, which is, I think, if the math is right, like one flicker every week. So like when I went to do these queries, this is what I got. <laughs> and I looked at it. And I kept looking at it. And seriously, I was like, the curiosity and the light would just drain from my eyes. And I was like, let's browse the internet. <laughs> this was not going to last. So I had this frustration. And so of course, like you do when you're frustrated, you ask your friends like, what to do. And so I'd seen CrossFilter.js, which is this amazing in-browser technology for slicing and dicing data. And I was like, I will use this. This is good. Um, and so I was like, hey, CrossFilter plus Hive. And you know, oh, I got crickets. Uh, and then I got wisecracking crickets, which, to be fair, are probably the best kind of crickets. Um, so I was like, OK, maybe sampling. Sampling could be a thing. Let's try that. Um, but So if you take 350 million things and you turn them into 350,000 things, all of a sudden things get a lot more tractable. Um, but then you introduce all kinds of errors because of sampling is hard to do correctly, especially um, on data that's nuanced. So you introduce errors, and then you also don't understand what errors you've introduced. Um, and I really cared about um, showing the right numbers when I was showing numbers. I think that's important. 
And then it came to me, aggregation. Aggregation is the key to visualizing big data. And it turns out, actually, um, to my shame, that people in BI have been talking about things like OLAP and cubes since like the 1970s, before I was born. Awesome. But given like the profound unsexiness of like the letters BI and like my personal dis distaste for like acronyms at all, I was just like, eh, whatever. These things can't possibly be important. Um, so like all of those who forget or ignore history, I was doomed to repeat it. So I did. Um, so here you can see data.csv, which is, um, as you can pretty much tell, not real data because it fits in a gist on GitHub. Um, it's the lower file snip snippet right over there, um, which could have, in, in theory, billions of rows. Obviously, it doesn't. Um, and the, the insight that I rediscovered uh, from the 1970s, unearthed it for myself, um, was that despite the billions of records, there's actually a limited number of values that can be present in each column. So it's the cardinality of the columns that really matter. 100 rows of data could be condensed into, for example, 132-year-old males from California on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Right? All of a sudden, you've got a 100-fold compression factor, just like that, by describing the, the possibilities rather than actually ha having literal data representation. So it's the product of these cardinalities. How many different ages? How many different genders? How many, don't assume they're just two genders, by the way. How many states? How many countries? And how many times? This really determines the maximum number of rows required to characterize your data set. So you can see above um, how that aggregation um, for this case could be expressed in SQL. Um, so props to me, I actually wrote a little bit of SQL. I'm like very proud of myself. Um, and you can imagine like doing uh, some kind of bucketing on the ages, on the countries or the states to kind of keep cardinalities in each of those different um, columns under control. Um, so like now we kind of have an approach that'll return a reasonable number of rows. Um, but how do you actually do this query, right? Like, you're still talking to Hive, and that means the big pinwheel of death, and then internet forever. So um, that's still a problem we have to solve. And um, the answer is basically cheat, um, right? So have an in-memory database. Um, so if big data is small RAM, get big RAM. Um, so in-memory databases um, give you big RAM to go with your big data. Um, Scuba is an in-memory database developed at, at Facebook. There's a paper about it um, uh, from which I stole this pretty awesome figure, kind of you know, just explaining uh, what's going on or trying to explain what's going on. Um, but basically, it distributes queries over lots of different machines, um, all of which have, that have data stored in RAM. Um, so queries that would take like tens of minutes uh, in Hive or even Presto, which is a lot faster than Hive, um, only takes seconds in Scuba. Unfortunately, Scuba is not currently an open source project. Um, so depending on your data volume, you might be OK using SQLite in memory on a single server that has a lot of RAM uh, if you want to try this on your own work. Um, or you might have to do a little research into in-memory databases. OK, so we've got a way of querying a database. And now we have a database. And now we need something to like give us data like in the front end. So this is the API layer. Um, I use Tornado because I love Python. Um, and also, Python like, allows me to get my fingers into all of Facebook's infrastructure via Thrift, um, which is basically a serialization format for um, talking to Java, PHP, whatever other backend services, C++ that we have, um, including Scuba. Gzip CSV, the last two parts there, are um, choices I made pretty carefully. Um, there's a bunch of other serialization formats for sending data from um, browsers, uh, or sorry, getting data in browsers from uh, from servers. Um, so like everyone's first choice, I think, like you just like yeah, you use JSON. JSON is like really good at describing data. Like JavaScript speaks it natively, and it's like awesome, but it's really verbose. Um, so when you're trying to send a lot of rows, um, you, you spend a lot of time just transferring the data. Um, so CSV is a lot more compact than JSON. And gzip, uh, you can actually just set the right header from your Tornado server, and um, your browser will go, hey, that's gzip data. I, I know how to unpack that. It's, it's native code in your browser. You don't ship any extra dependencies. It's great. Um, it was the right trade-off for me for um, compactness and overall speed, which overall speed, by the way, is like encoding, transfer, decoding. Um, 
So there's these things that will make your data smaller, but then you have to like ship a decoder along and then decode data on the client. There's actually a project from the New York Times um, called Tamper, which was launched, I think, last week. Um, it's another serialization protocol, which really promises pretty good um, compression. Um, and I'd like to look into it. Um, there's no Python encoder currently. So um, I have been planning to, to write one. Um, if somebody else wants to raise their hand and say, like, they'll do it, awesome. Looks around, hopefully. No, OK, I'm going to write one. Um, so finally, we're like at CrossFilter, um, which is the thing that sort of started this whole question. Like, how do I get data into the browser and use CrossFilter to like really do these fast intersections? Um, CrossFilter is open source. It was done by Mike Bostock, um, who's now at the New York Times. Um, it allows you to do the fast slicing and dicing on millions of rows, and it allows you to update these coordinated views. So, you know, you, you're selecting a range of ages, and you see the genders. Uh, so like just update you know, in milliseconds. There's no extra uh, query to the server that's involved. DC.js is a really nice library um, that allows you to just get charts for free in the browser without like, going through D3 and going, OK, right, how does D3 work again? Um, which is <laughs> what ends up happening unless you're spending a lot of time in D3. Um, so those are pretty much all the pieces. Um, this is the tiny snippet of code that allows you to um, Use the cross-filter API with the aggregates that we well that we computed in SQL, um, and this comes basically it's a, just a small modification of stuff that was already in the documentation, um, but it took me a while to figure out. RTFM. Um, so here's the whole picture of of what what we've talked about so far. Um, so we need a, a data source. Um, this is coming in from PTL, which is basically this uh, another Facebook technology. Um, that, that has been talked about. Um, there's a good paper on PTL and Puma, uh, which basically you can think of it as just um, tailing a log file. You're getting data from tons of servers um, and all these different streams. Uh, and they're just going into this in-memory database called Scuba. Um, and it allows you to then query from your, from your API server this in-memory data that's pretty fresh. Um, and of course, like we have our CSV gzip um, API, but there's also JSON APIs that you can make for smaller queries where you don't really care that much about you're not sending huge amounts of data, you're sending you know, metadata um, for easy JavaScript usability. Um, although PTEL is internal to Facebook, Apache Flume um, is an open source project that will give you some of the same capabilities. And so let's take a look at the full system. Um, so I really wanted to do this. Um, but I actually had some problems convincing our legal department it was a good idea. Um, so check out the CrossFilter demo page um, and pretend you're playing with fresh Facebook data. Um, it, like, I really, I, I, in all seriousness, I suggest like, go to the CrossFilter page and play with the demo. It will inspire you. It's fast. Um, what, can, what I can show you, if I can't show you the actual tool, I'll show you the impact of the tool. Um, so this man is uh, president. Uh, it's Barack Obama. During the State of the Union address this year, an analyst at Facebook was able to use this tool that I made to slice and dice the audience around different topics related to keywords in his speech as he was spe speaking them. So they would hear a word, and they'd go, oh, what's being said about this word? And the piece of information highlighted at the bottom here, men are talking about the economy. Women are talking about inequality. That data came directly from queries that an analyst at Facebook did. Using the, using the stack that was described in the previous slide. So the API that the, the person in the newsroom used was this really old API called the telephone. <laughs> uh, so that's like this puzzle piece that we haven't quite figured out how to make this work. So there's actually a person at Facebook with a telephone, not me, and a person uh, in the newsroom uh, with a telephone saying, hey, what's, what can you tell me that's interesting? And, the person at Facebook is like typing and talking. Um, so technology meets the real world. <laughs> OK, so what's next? So what I did here, actually, um, was to develop a new stack for working on agile data products at Facebook, one that I was much more comfortable with. 
And I'd like to extend that stack by building reusable cross-filter-friendly charting components using React um, to make assembling visualizations like this a little easier in the future. React, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is um, basically a, a JavaScript library for really making it easy to make uh, user interfaces, uh, basically web front ends, um, out of components instead of like just crazy soup of JavaScript. Um, with any luck, you should see some of that work open source later this year. Um, if you've actually done any work with React and D3, um, hit me up afterwards. I'd love to talk about it. Um, OK, so we talked about one way to take a big data set and make it more manageable using aggregation. Um, so here's another one. Fresh data. I forgot to say revolution. Fresh data revolution. What I mean by fresh data, um, of course, is timely or real-time data. So Facebook has, I think, like our latest published numbers is like 500 terabytes of data that we get per day, um, which is like sort of a lot. Um, and so, like, if you if you divide that down, that's like roughly five gigabytes per second, give or take. Um, so that five gigabytes of data is sort of a lot to like actually put through a network card. Um, but if you only care about certain kinds of data, like maybe um, English text posts or check-ins or some other kind of specific data type, you can actually be down in a really manageable range of data almost before you know it. Fresh data is relevant because it's recent. And it's exciting. So I think you should really add this to your big data buzzwords. Big data, thick data, fresh data. But I have a secret. I really was excited about this because I wanted to make some blinking lights on my monitor. I was like, yeah, data should make like colors happen. I want a good screensaver. So don't tell anyone. Um, so at Facebook, every month or two, the company has a hackathon. They're at least 24 hours, but they can last several days. Um, during that time, if you choose to participate, you can come up with an idea for a project or partner with other people for a project. Um, at, and at the end, everyone has a chance to present their work to other hackers. Many features on Facebook.com actually started as hackathon projects. Uh, video upload, chat, and even the like button were all hackathon projects. Um, as a data and visualization geek, I'm a little less interested in shipping features to Facebook.com, and I'm more interested in making projects to visualize data. Uh, it's the reason that I actually joined Facebook in the first place. So my hackathon projects have really been about around data visualization. And the first one that I did was to try to build a real-time map of public check-ins. I gave a talk at Strata a couple years ago about visualizing geodata. And I'd made some real, non-real-time visualizations of check-ins using tile mill and processing. This time, I wanted to build something similar for the web and make it real-time. So it was this, but I didn't know that at first, of course. Um, I never le used leaflet.js before. I'm going to talk about all the different pieces and kind of how they fit together. Um, but I'd heard really good things about it. Leaflet is a, basically a, a library for displaying tiles, um, tiled maps like uh, Google Maps, so you don't have to load tons of data at once. You can just zoom in and get details on demand. Um, I used a cloud-made cloud, uh, cloud tile source, um, and that was pretty easy to get working. But I needed, actually, not just to show a map. I needed to show data on the map. Um, so remember PCL from before? I'm starting like right at the, at the bottom of this, the web client. And then I was like, OK, great. How do I get data? So then I'm like starting right at the top left. PTL is my data source. So I can get the stream of public check-ins. Awesome. Um, but then I was like, OK, how do all those middle things work? How do I get from I'm sitting here in my you know, SSH terminal, and I have a stream of data coming through. And then I have this web server that's showing me a map, and there's nothing. I needed to tie those things together. Um, so I have this Python script called processor.py, which basically tells me um, how to reformulate that data and how to ignore data that I don't want to touch. Um, ignoring data really quickly is a bit of an art, but it's actually really important, especially in real-time systems. Um, so processor.py just says, hey, this is a public check-in. Do stuff with it. And, um, Form, formats like a nice little packet for me. Um, zero MQ, I didn't know anything about, except for that um, people had, had talked about it and said it was good. Um, so I was like, hey, more new things. Um, 
And the documentation for Zero MQ is like, I think it's like the high water mark for like documentation for projects. It's really super readable. It was actually almost fun. Um, so I read the docs and decided on this push-pull architecture where the processor scripts can just like push data away once it's done with it. And the um, Tornado web server, which of course uh, is going to be serving up our web page, is going to be pulling data um, that's getting pushed by this other process. So I've got a pusher of like data that's happening in real time, and I've got a puller. Um, the question is, great, I've got all this data coming in. Uh, how do I get this to the client? Um, so what better way to do this than WebSockets, which is sort of just like continue the flow. Um, I'd also never used WebSockets, um, but everything had been going well so far, and it wasn't like sunrise yet, so I was like, let's keep going with WebSockets. Um, and it turns out WebSockets are pretty easy to use. Um, so they sound like they might be, they sounded to me like they might be complicated, but it was like really a few lines of JavaScript. Um, so the WebSocket basically receives new events and puts them in a queue in the, on the front end. So we're getting this queue of, of data points coming in, and I just have an update loop that just repaints the screen every 30 seconds um, to get a good frame rate. And then I can just use D3.js to um, show the points kind of arriving. So they're just getting a little bit smaller as they seem to like fall on the map. Um, I limited the size of the queue to make sure that there weren't like you know crazy um, bursts in the data volume so that you end up with like you know uh -oh, a million points or something like that. Um, so for performance reasons, um, I limited that to about 500. Um, I'm sure that number could be tweaked a little bit. And just throw away things if you get too many. Very principled. Um, so I had this check-in uh, events, and I had these dots. But I was like, I need colors for the dots. Colors are important when you're trying to make blinking lights. Um, so I realized check-ins often have text associated with them. Um, and I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could look at the sentiment for the, for the text and, and color the dots by the sentiment? And it turns out one of my teammates, Ryan Rosario, who's sitting in the back of the room, who will be talking about his sentiment classifier um, later this afternoon in this room, had built a sentiment classifier. So I was like, super, let's just wire this thing up, and we'll just get a score for each one of these check-ins uh, between you know, negative, positive, neutral. And all of a sudden, I went from you know, flashing dots to flashing colored dots. And believe me, that was a good moment. Um, I'm going to show you an early screenshot. Um, it's the first screenshot I have of the project working. And there's like a map with dots on it. It's a lot more exciting when it's, when it's running. Um, I unfortunately didn't save a movie um, at the time. But this is the finished product. So like basically one night of hacking and um, lots of blinking lights. So as a data visualization hack, I didn't have any hopes of getting this like incorporated into Facebook.com. I don't know who would want to go to their newsfeed and see something like this. Um, if you do, I like you. <laughs> Um, so I just set it as my screensaver using WebSaver, which is this awesome um, thing for OS X, which allows you to just take a URL and turn it into your screensaver. So if you have any kind of fun data sketches, um, you just you know, put them wherever you want, host them, and just point this WebSaver at the URL, and all of a sudden you've got a screensaver. Um, and I got all these sparkling dots, which is what I was hoping for, right? the, the things you do for sparkling dots. Um, after the project had been running for a while, I thought I started to notice some patterns. Kind of can't see this very well at all. It looks better on that screen, but that doesn't really help you guys. Um, so I made a static version of the map. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to make you do that. <laughs> um, so I just took a few hours of data and plotted them on a hex bin map. And so these things are actually little hexagons. And that's actually a map, but OK, let's just let's move on. Um, so although this might have been more informative about long-term trends, um, I, like, in particular, I suspected that people in the UK were just more negative than everyone else. I, um, and you can see like a, a little red dot, a little red angry dot. Um, but it wasn't a blinking light, and so people looked at it and they said, that's cool, but then they stopped looking at it because it wasn't blinking at them. So people in my group uh, started showing, actually, the live map um, to people at the end of meetings. They're just like, hey, check it out, some blinking lights. 
And it was like it started all of these conversations about real time data and using text algorithms. So even though it was like basically, let's show Jason some shiny lights, um, it actually started some really good conversations. And eventually, it led to getting like you know the most important thing you could possibly do when you're making an internal tool: executives saying nice things about the tool, and you know, starting some good conversations. Um, so to build on this approach, um, which is just to recap, PTL plus some NLP plus zero MQ plus tornado plus web sockets. I'm like, okay, cool. I've got these five things. I understand how they work. So let's let's do something else with them. So I decided real-time text analytics was a thing I should work on. And I saw this ad in my feed and uh, on Facebook. And I was like, yeah, people are talking about Game of Thrones on Facebook. And if you don't watch Game of Thrones as soon as possible, you'll find out things you, you would prefer not to know. Um, but what are people saying about Game of Thrones? Similarly for House of Cards, within like a few days of being released, House of Cards on Netflix, um, People, like 7 million people had talked about this thing on Facebook. Um, so like 7 million is like a little bit too much to read. I don't know how fast you guys read. Um, it was too much to read for me. So let's take this real-time data approach and see like as you're watching a live event, what are people saying about this event? I tried this during the Oscars. I was actually, um, I projected this visualization um, while I was trying to watch the Oscars. And it turns out, yes, it's super cool to see what people are saying like during a real-time event, but it's also really distracting. Um, so I can't say I recommend this as like your day-to-day -day viewing experience. Um, so here's the same, sort of a very similar architecture to what I had before. Um, the major differences are um, we're PTLing a different data source. Uh, we have these magic NLP boxes, um, and the UI at the end is kind of different. So I'll show you the UI. This is a screen capture from American Idol. Um, I ran it later for the Discovery Channel show, Naked and Afraid. Um, if you're not familiar with the show, two contestants try to survive for 30 days um, after being dropped in a strange place with nothing but their clothes on their back. And the first thing they do when they get there is they take their clothes off. <laughs> and of course, they're strangers of opposite genders. So um, I guess that's how you get viewers these days. Um, so as a result of making this tool, I was actually to get, able to get on-air integrations of, um, of insights that I'd picked up from these audiences about, uh, for the show American Idol, for Naked of Afraid, and um, for insert more here. It's very exciting. Um, so one of the things that's had a lot of engagement is just entertaining hashtags that people end up creating and, um, and sharing. And producers are like, oh my gosh, we never would have found this hashtag without, without this tool. Um, so one of those hashtags was uh, for naked and afraid. Um, anyone want to guess? Uh, it was lots of butts. <laughs> so um, I'm very proud, and I'm sure my parents are too. Um, so what's next for this approach? I think using Cubism JS is another front-end framework for time series visualization. Um, it's designed for actually doing principled um, display of time series data. And it uses horizon plots. Um, this is a little washed out here. But you can see, um, basically, you don't have to worry about giant bars. Like you're like, oh, a spike in traffic, it, just, it actually just folds over itself nicely and gets denser. Um, so I think horizon plots are pretty awesome. Um, there's not currently a nice Python backend for supporting um, cubism. So I'm going to think about working on something like that. If you use graphite or, or cube um, as your backend, you're, you're good to go. Um, so here's like the silliest part of this talk. Um, so like we've got big data, why not use a big screen? Right? It's obvious. <laughs> Should do this. Like a really big screen. Um, so like around the corner, um, there's you may you may have seen if you haven't seen it yet, um, like go out not not right now. Um, like literally right around the corner, um, there's a 20 foot long display. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the process of kind of putting that together as part of what Facebook calls the Executive Briefing Center. Um, this work was done with uh, as a collaboration between uh, me and some other folks at Facebook and the design studio Pitch Interactive. So a lot of the front end stuff you'll see here is done by, um, by those guys. Uh, in the bottom right here, um, you can see what looks like a server rack. But this is actually this super exotic piece of hardware ca called uh, a Vista Spider X20, which is like uh, necessary for powering like 20 screens at the same time. Um, I had never heard of such a thing before I started this project. 
Um, so like, I'm really lucky that I work at Facebook and other people know a lot more than I do. Um, so here are the specs, um, which I really drilled over for a while. Um, so let me just, um, 20 feet long, 41 megapixels, 36 touch points, and 20 individual displays. So why would we do something like this? So as you can maybe tell, this is a marketing-driven project. Um, here's what marketing has to say about the project. And I'm not going to read that to you. But for me, it was about a way of taking data and making it more tangible and more real. For me, it was about taking data visualization and turning it into data visceralization to present clients with data that really touches them and really speaks to them. And in turn, they can touch it and speak to it if they want. Um, so how did we do this? It took about two to three months, actually, to put it together. There were hardware people who knew about spiders and X20s, um, a visualization studio, very talented people, um, me to sort of um, help figure out how to put all the pieces together, and all of us to keep saying no to marketing people. They're like, you know, we can't do that. It's going to take too long. This is not a good idea. So saying no can, can be a full-time job. And it was for a while, actually. Um, so we knew we needed a lot of screens, so we started um, you know, building these mounts, and we started calling the project the wall. It's called the Insights Wall now. Um, and Wes, the guy at Pitch Interactive, actually had this great idea. Let's just show a Chrome tab in full screen mode, um, which basically means, hey, you can just use your normal UI uh, stack for doing, like, web stack for making the UI. Awesome. Um, however, we ended up just finding out that to get decent animations, we had to use WebGL. Um, so we have the whole sort of Facebook stack that I've talked about earlier, PrestoDB, uh, like pretty much every t piece of Facebook infrastructure you can think of, I, I, I wrote a connector to or used an existing connector to um, to pull data for this wall. We use data swarm pipelines to, um, to gather huge amounts of data and sort of summarize them. Uh, every time uh, we, a new client comes in, we actually use PrestoDB to do a, a query that takes a few minutes um, to calculate information about their particular audience. Um, and then we built some visualizations that everyone can see that's not very specific to anyone um, that are just fun for people who are visiting. Uh, with 36 touch points um, come like a lot of different problems. I want to show you this loop. I don't have audio here, um, but this is Wes from Pitch Interactive just doing some really uh, principled testing where he's just rolling his body over the wall. Uh, I thought that was really important to show. And like what you can't hear is he's just saying bugs, bugs, bugs. Bugs, bugs. Um, so 36 touch points means a lot of API calls, actually. Um, so being async is super important. Um, it's really great that Tornado supports this out of the box. Um, getting the IR touchscreen tuned was also really important. Um, trending data means you have to deal with profanity showing up and visitors being shown profanity. I never expected that I was going to have to work on that. Uh, one, one particular viral campaign actually had a hashtag uh, that was related, I didn't know at the time, to like uh, testicular cancer awareness, um, but the hashtag did, um, did not make that clear. <laughs> um, so this is the ar architecture you can see. It's got a lot in common with the previous things. You can see all of the data sources. Uh, Tau is a graph database we have, PrestoDB, Scuba. Um, the Pitch Interactive used Node.js for all the visualizations, so we got to, got to add a new box. Um, and you see here, like, this is the impact. This is a bunch of people looking at their data and getting pretty excited about it. And of course, like, when you're excited, you take pictures. So you can see at least one, <laughs> one person is, is taking a picture of the thing he's seeing. Um, if you want to check it out, um, it's right around the corner. I'd love to give you your own uh, personal tour if you want to know about it. Um, so what have we learned? Um, in order to visualize data, you got to make it small and or if you can, you got to make your screen big. And what I learned was that to be successful in a new place really requires combining the familiar, the things you know really well, with the new. If you can find a way to play to your existing strengths while developing new ones, you'll seldom go wrong. If any of this was at all interesting to you, please come find me afterwards. I'd love to talk more about it. And if there are questions, I would be happy to answer them.